I would like to call the January 23rd meeting of the Stonington Board of Education to order. Uh, can we all stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance? We've broken the agenda for tonight in, in, in almost in two parts. So the first set of comments from citizens will be relative to the budget and the calendar items. And then we will review and have discussion on the budget and also take action on the 2019 and 2020 school calendar and the 2021 school calendar. Are there any comments from citizens relative to budget or the calendar items? Tracy Swain and I reside in Pocketop. Excuse me, can you please pick up the microphone and talk into it? Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Tracy Swain and I reside in Pocketop. I'm a bit mystified. Bear with me, please. During the April 9th, 2019 Board of Finance public hearing held at the high school auditorium, board members on the finance, Tim O'Brien, Mike Fabrak, Lynn Young, June Strzok, Glenn Fishman, Blunt White, and Danielle Cheeseborough. In, in the Board of Ed section of the budget, page 10, of the meeting minutes, page 10, Chairwoman Strunk, who is now a member of our Board of Select Women, states that in the state of Connecticut, there is a statute that does not permit towns to cut the education budget unless there are several scenarios that happen, five scenarios in particular. There is a state statute minimum budget requirement that will allow a cut in the Board of Education budget. Another, if there is a decline in student enrollment. If there's a cost cut in education, cost share funding. The other three scenarios do not apply to Stonington. June Strzok stated that the board does have a document submitted by the superintendent that shows the enrollment projection for the next year is actually an increase of five students. Many of them are coming from kindergarten, in addition to an increase of 18 students for kindergarten already registered in September. So the Board of Finance did not increase the line item because Riley stated there was an increase in students. This year, the Board of Finance gave you a gui guidance of 0% increase, and you ignored them and came back with a 3.5% increase. My pr number there might be incorrect, but it's about that. Now, on January 9th, the residents were presented with the Sunnington Public Schools proposed budget. On this budget, on page 3, it reads as follows. The district has experienced declining enrollment for the past several years and will continue to have a slight decline for the next few years. This decline has already resulted in the reduced staffing and was part of the decision to consolidate the middle schools and reformat the elementary program grade levels. Now, in this meeting minutes from this January 9th meeting on page 3, it reads as follows. Van explains that the schedule and timeline of the budget process. He spoke on the format of the budget, explained the needs and challenge of the district, changes that have happened in the past year, decline in enrollment, program equality, impact on programs and staffing. So. In the letter to the Board of Finance, he stated the incoming kindergarten kids, never once did he mention the outgoing seniors. If there are 24 graduating and 18 kids coming in, that would give us a negative number. So this may explain why our school budget is so overinflated, the fact that Van Riley does not seem to understand simple addition and attraction. And more manipulates the situation to bring into the school system because he clearly has no concept of money with a salary of $202,000 a year. So, in 1987, the senior high school class was 232, according to graduate Kevin Burns of that year. In 1984, that class was even larger. In the 80s, those classes were in the range of 200 and more. Stonington High offered more classes than they do now. Sometime between 84 and 87, high Stonington High was ranked top 10 in the country of public schools. Now we spend more per student and the kids have less of an education. Ms. Anderson, who's not here tonight, stated at the last meeting that the school system is the best it has ever seen. Now, Mr. Morehouse, you know firsthand as being a graduate from Stonington Board of Ed, 
that in the 19, 2019, there was a total of 170 kids, which is a lot less than when he graduated in the 80s. You have a lot of catching up to do to bring the school system back to the quality of the education it had in the 1980s. Bottom line, Van Riley lied to the members of the Board of Education, Board of Finance, and the residents of the town of Stonington. Do you board members really trust him? I don't. For he, that's why he lost my respect. I think you board of members need to see a much more detailed budget report than what was presented to us on January 9th. Don't look like fools anymore. Stop drinking the Kool-Aid he seems to be giving you. And reminder to each of you board members, this superintendent and any future superintendent work for you, not you work for him. Is there any other public comment regarding the budget or the calendar items? We'll move on to budget review. Tonight we will be answering questions that the Board of Ed had since the last meeting. Um, once again, the direction from the board was to provide a budget that met the educational needs of the students and the needs of our teachers and we have done so. I would like to uh, point out first off that we have been able to reduce the uh, bottom line from 3.48 percent to 3.05 percent. Um, Gary worked some magic with the health insurance numbers. We got some new, actually we got some new um, estimates in and that helped there. And then we had one, uh, we resolved an issue of a teacher coming back from leave. So we were able to reduce the, the budget by about a half a percent. So we're pleased with that. The final Board of Ed approval for the budget will occur on February 13th at the regular board meeting. There is a possibility after tonight, if you'd like, we could have another special meeting on February 6th if you still have questions or need more information. I would like to say that this budget um, also, in addition to meeting the needs of the students and the teachers, is a stable budget. I want to use the word stability and consistency because it's important for us not to jump around with, with a budget if possible. Um, we uh, try to provide level staffing whenever possible and proper planning. And with that, you'll see how those concepts are in the budget tonight and are included in some of the answers to the Board of Ed's questions. I would also uh, just make one statement. Uh, Mr. Morehouse submitted a request for some information on staffing, and we, w we don't have that tonight. It was a lot of work. We will have that for you in the next week or so. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Mr. Shuttle to answer the board's questions, numbers one through 17. You have those in a written form, but Gary, if you could please go over those for the board. Sure. I think you have the piece of paper in front of you, if I'm not mistaken, as far as the questions, the Q&A should be a second page or after the agenda items. So the first question was about dues and fees going up. You can see the reasons for that. A new management system for scheduling at the high school. We have a new dashboard services from EastCon for the team. And we have a slight increase in the library management systems services. As you can see over to the right hand side, that's a almost a half price decrease in three years for that system. Next question was about curriculum and the $15,000 for transportation increase. It's all related to summer school that we want to provide. Well, this, this current year, those funds came from Title I grant funds. In the upcoming year, the Title I grant funds are going to be used for wages, so they're not available to provide transportation for summer school for our students. Number three was just a question about transportation fuel of $200,000. Uh, 
that's just been switched from administration where it used to be to operations. It really belongs under operations and not administrations. It's fuel for our buses that we have to buy. And so regular transportation is now under operations. So it's really just going from one place to another place. That's all. New equipment you had asked about, as you can see, most of that increase is for a new floor scrubber at Stonington Middle School. So we can keep the building in the condition it should be in. And you wondered about the repairs and maintenance, $8,000 increase with the elimination of two, the two buildings, the West Broad Street School building and the old administration building. As you can recall, we still have eight to 10 HVAC systems, RTUs at the high school that need to be replaced. And so that's a price tag of approximately $800,000. Uh, we don't have that $800,000 that's been brought to the attention of the boards of finance and the capital improvement plan. So we still need provisions in order to repair those systems uh, when they do go down because we need those operational as best we can until the actually the inner workings can be repaired. And there's also, we need additional funds for the middle school roof of about $64,000. Uh, we thought the roof was gonna come in at about $1.2 million. It's a little bit over that. It's about $64,000 more than that. So the Board of Finance has already approved the $1.186 million. So we thought we would just take the $64,000 from our general fund budget in the upcoming year. Professional technical services. As you can see, we have uh, new building management systems at both the elementary schools, brand new. We have a building management system at the high school, and we want to at least install one at the middle school in here, and so that all of the systems would go to one central control point, and every system could talk to the other system. So we'd have one central point to control heat, air conditioning throughout the district, get alerts when something's not working properly. So that's the plan. So we can incorporate all the systems into one central location, use the software that's there, and provide good services. And the other one still is for, as you can see, engineering for the HVAC systems. Something goes down with those RTUs, we have to call an MCOR to say, okay, What's, what's happening? What's going wrong? Why aren't these, these units working again or still, however you want to phrase it? Term aid, we just, I changed that to uh, paraprofessional wages. So you'll see that throughout your backup sheets. Building rentals, uh, for the most part, a little bit of administrative rentals and also the swimming rental for Fitch High School. Uh, they've increased it for us this year and the upcoming year. It was very low, uh, and so they needed to increase that so we can use the, their pool. We have, a, I believe, a cooperative team with them, Mr. Freeze. We have a cooperative team with the high school, with Fitch High School, for our swimmers. Non-instructional equipment going up by $800. You can read that. It's really for reconditioning of the football helmets at the high school. The athletic directors expecting an increase in the number of players. So we have to buy new helmets. The old helmets have to be certified as being safe. And that's not a, it's actually a very expensive item because new helmets are expensive and reconditioning so they meet the safety standards are just as expensive. Percentages of towns uh, I, I went and just really took, on page three, I looked at towns in our area. Uh, as you can see, this is information I did not conjure up. Uh, it came from Connecticut Data Collaborative and CERC on the top. Uh, and on the bottom, it came from water reports from the Office of Policy and Management. And so you can see the top item is total expenditures in 2017. And so that's looking at the total town budget and how much by each Board of Education was expended in that year. Again, those are items from this collaborative in CERC. So it's out there for anybody's viewing. 
and the second one is budgeting. Again, I went to the Office of Policy and Management and looked at the audit reports that were filed with them to look at these figures as well. So those are are two areas that anybody can go online and find those figures out. Uh, there was no manip manipulation of those figures, came right through those from those studies. Tuition charges, magnet schools, adult ed, special need, outside placements. I put an increase of 3% in for magnet schools and VOAG. Uh, you never, I mean, you never know what the numbers are going to be because the magnet schools don't report to us a preliminary in late May, early June, and we don't get the final figures literally until October 1st. That's when we have to provide the state with our enrollment. That's when the magnet schools have to provide the state with the enrollment and then send us the bill for the number of students that we have going to those schools. Uh, we, we have no agreements with LEARN or New London as far as the minimum number of students we have to send or the maximum number of students that have to be sent there. It's by lottery. We only have one agreement with New London. I believe it's at the regional uh, magnet school that says we'll pay for no more than 17. We could send more. New London realizes that we don't have to pay. We don't have to pay for more than 17. That's a long-standing MOU with the uh, New London Public Schools. Um, as you can see, for the magnet schools, adult ed, and the VOAG, we're expecting an increase of just over $12,000. Uh, the bulk of the estimated increase comes from the needs for special needs outside placements. Uh, that's an increase of about $200,000 uh, that we're looking at for the upcoming year. So that's the bulk of it. Uh, someone had asked about outside tuition costs for special ed. This is current year's number. It's just over $3 million that we're expecting for the current year. Adult Ed, we paid just over $68,000. Uh, on the next page, you can see what the cost of tuition per pupil is for this year for Learn Magnet Schools. The total we paid to learn for our students, just over $282,000. New London Schools, same thing, cost per pupil per school. We spent about just over $83,000 this year to send students to New London schools and for the VOAG tech schools in Ledger, uh, just under $48,000 for the current year. Paraprofessional salaries, uh, I put the amount in, in there of $769,000 through December 31st. That's really not their half year point because paraprofessionals are paid on the student days. They work the student days and they get paid for some holidays plus one paraprofessional day. So this represents as of December 31st, that cost. Uh, they're not there, they're not at the halfway point yet uh, for paraprofessional salaries for the current year. And for the next year's budget, that includes all the positions we have currently in the budget plus one additional position for in-school suspension and security at the Stonington Middle School. Uh, so that's the only increase as compared to what we have right now for next year for four pair professional salaries. OPEB, that's other post-employment benefits. The amount that we have in the budget came from the town of Stonington. Uh, Director of Finance on the town side sent me that number to include in our budget for the upcoming year. Health insurance, that's one of the decreases in the budget being presented tonight. Uh, that came from an updated estimate from our health benefit consultants. And so that's the latest estimate that we have from our health benefit consultants. And that was two, week, two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, not quite two weeks ago. So those have been updated since the last board meeting. Public utilities, public utilities is really a decrease in the upcoming year of $154,000. Uh, if you remember, uh, Peter Anderson and representative from MCOR made a presentation to you about an energy study that is underway right now. And so we need time for them to undertake that study, analyze the results, 
and see what additional areas of energy conservation that we might be able to implement in the upcoming year. But even with those energy conservation methods, it's not necessarily a zero-sum game depending on what we want to do for energy conservation. Uh, some don't pay for themselves in five years or six years. Some go out a little bit farther. So depending on what energy conservation methods that we're going to implement, you know, that would, that would amount to at least uh, some savings to us in the out years. It's not a zero-sum game in the upcoming year. Uh, and so that somebody asked for the six months, what we spent, we spent just under $345,000 for public utilities on the six-month area. Gate receipts, we had just under $10,000 for Thanksgiving. The upcoming year, we've included $15,000. We've done that since I've been here, and, and I'm told that's been historical. $15,000 has always been included in the budget for gate receipts. Some years it's a little bit less, some years it's a little bit more. Again, it depends on how many people show up for basketball games, how many people show up for football games. So that's, that's a fluctuating number. It's, it's not a very large number at all. And the last question somebody had asked about uh, the cost of FOI requests, which is just over $45,000 over two years for attorney fees and the OCA, Office of Child Advocates, over two years is just over $7,200. So that's the responses to the questions that were answered, asked, uh, asked to this point. Thank you, Gary. Um, question number 18 from the board had to do with what we're currently doing uh, as far as sharing of services. You'll see a, a memo um, from me to the board chair and in this memo, it outlines a couple things. Uh, question number one, what items are shared between the town and the district <clears throat> that we cover in our budget? And we've looked at this year so far. Uh, Peter looked at 191 days, um, totaling 4,276 hours plus 136 overtime hours. <clears throat> so the cost covered by the district uh, for the custodial time, and this is for recreation and other meetings, would be approximately $108,000. Plus those hours, the cost for heating, lighting, air conditioning, etc., is approximately $22,000. Um, question number two, what funding could be eliminated or reduced if the town assumed all of the landscaping responsibilities as discussed at a meeting a couple weeks ago? We could immediately eliminate a CIP request for 45825 for tractors. In addition, the district would not need an anticipated grounds position. It's not in the budget now, but it could be in the, in the future. So basically, we wanted to, the board to know that we support town activities to the tune of about $130,000 yearly for custodial time and utilities, and if we continue with the agreement that we're hopeful to uh, in, to work with the town, we could eliminate the need for the $45,000 CIPs. Then on the last page of this, um, this handout, there was a question, can we have more detailed explanation for keeping the class sizes at West Vine? Um, I would like uh, Ms. McCurdy and Ms. Daw to give an explanation as to the value of keeping the programs that we have currently. <laughs> I wanted to make sure everybody was up. <laughs> We're all here. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I guess tonight we just wanted to um, express and elaborate on the importance of keeping uh, the two elementary schools equitable. Um, the instructional model that we currently have right now in grades three through five is a co-teaching model. Uh, we recently just establ established that just a few years ago, and it really does provide a stable, equitable, 
consistent instructional model for our students in grades three, four, and five at both elementary schools. Um, while our enrollment does rise and fall, especially at West Vine, we do have a very transient population. So it is especially important that we have two sets of eyes on every single student in grades three, four, and five. It also allows for equitable professional development amongst the teachers to collaborate, and it truly has made these teachers master teachers in their core subject areas. Um, aside from our scores that we have seen steady improvement on, um, it truly does provide a stable environment for all of our students, a consistent delivery of instruction um, that we feel is imperative to move our students forward, especially with the rise and fall of our enrollment, and we do have an increasing transient population in our school. So um, I'm happy to answer questions in regards to that, um, but I do thank you for your support in the past couple of years of allowing us to continue that co-teaching model, um, and we're hoping you continue that support with us in regards to especially looking at our enrollment throughout the years. I know, the, I know the question was pointed to more towards West Vine, but I did just want to share with you too in looking at the enrollment numbers for Dean's Mill. <clears throat> I know um, last year there was some discussion about cutting a grade level based on enrollment. Um, and just to kind of give you an understanding of the significance of that. So when we have teachers that are specialized in instructional content, that's what their training is really in. So when we met, moved to this model, and let's, I'm gonna use fourth grade, because right now third grade is my lowest number. Um, and so for the situation at Dean's Mill is a little bit different because I have this cohort of students that's really small, but then the future years are showing solid four sections of, you know, 21 students or something like that. I have one cohort. So let's say fourth grade, for example, you know, I have two teachers that have a lots of training in language arts and social studies over the past of the years, and then two other teachers that have been training in math and science. So cutting that section would mean that there would be a teacher who hasn't participated in some of the professional development for the past two years, now needing to catch up on speed to teach it. And in the, in the instance of Dean's Mill School, it would be for a one year model because we know that our second grade numbers and our kindergarten numbers and our first grade numbers would really keep at that what we've talked about as a board having that 21 to 23 so um, you know you can just see we, we always struggle with equity and do you, how do you do equity is it equity versus class size or is equity in terms of giving students the similar experience and having the teachers have the similar instruction so you know I think in terms of looking at that you know I know for us it's that consistency and you know it's nothing would be more frustrating and I lived a life at the middle school for several years where teaming was always changed based on enrollment and so you went from four teachers to three teachers to two teachers and teachers invest a lot of time and we invest a lot of money in their training and so to continue to say, well, now we're going to do it this model this year because we have 15 students, but next year we're going to have 20, so we're going to go back to the other model is, is a huge task to take not only on um, the teachers itself, but also on the money we're putting forward for professional development and making sure that those teachers are trained adequately. So again, if you have any questions. Yeah, I'd like Mr. Freeze to also address uh, the issue of the keeping the number of teachers at a stable level and how that impacts programs. All right, thank you, Van. Um, first, I'd like to thank the board for their support of the many offerings we have at Stonington High School. I think much of our success is because we have a, a wide variety of ch uh, course choices for our students. Uh, your support has allowed us to have you know, up to over 18 AP, e AP and EC courses and numerous career technical education classes to prepare students for success after high school. But to be able to do this, you know, we need to have the flexibility to have an occasional smaller class, and that's currently what we're experiencing now. Uh, we shifted our scheduling for power school to use the computer to help us get maximum percentage of student choices for the student, for the kids. And right now, the last two years since we switched that model, we're over 95% every year in giving the kids the classes that they want. And in order to do that, that is that we have to have that ability to have an extra section of one, you know, one subject uh, you know, as part of the schedule. So we never have to have the, the time where a kid or a, might not have the ability to take jazz band, for instance, because that's when the English class that they want or need is also being scheduled. Or a, a student who wants to take Wood Tech 2 and get that, that full year of wood tech to prepare them for opportunities outside of school. 
if that's only available on the same time where the math class that he needs to graduate is, uh, you know, that would be tragic if they wouldn't have that opportunity. And so having the ability to split classes and have, you know, in addition, you know actually two smaller classes here and there uh, is, is something that allows the kids to get the opportunities and the choices they want. You know, and additionally, we also we're in the, the middle of deleveling you know, many of our core classes and you know, to include to improve student engagement throughout you know, the school. And you know, this has necessitated us to refocus our co-teaching efforts. You know, so uh, we're, we're redesigning lessons, we're kind of refigure, we're figuring out how to reach every student in the class as we provide a rigorous curriculum for all students. And additionally, we're also doing complete rewrites on virtually every curriculum in the high school. You know, both of these are NEAS accreditation uh, recommendations that we are acting on. You know, so maintain, you know, maintaining the levels right now is what is going to allow our kids in the future to have the same choices that kids have now. Thank you. I'd like uh, Mr. Smith to address the uh, same program issues at the middle school and also um, there was a question about the administrative, the two assistant principals. Mr. Smith? Good evening. Um, the message of consistency uh, in programming and staffing uh, is my primary goal. When we decided to consolidate the two middle schools, we all stated and restated that it was not just to save money. Our goal was to raise student achievement, lower the barriers to equity, and to create a better, more relevant educational experience for every middle school student in Stonington. Making cuts to the administrative team now, just as the school's initial year is coming to a close, will seriously derail the success of the consolidation. It's not just uh, flip the switch and we're a brand new school uh, in a single year. The student-teacher ratio is too blunt of an instrument to use in making this decision. Everyone knows that adolescence is the greatest period of change in human development, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Developmentally, middle school students need the most support with behavior. We all know a big gap exists between their impulse for risk-taking and their ability to think before they act. Uh, last week, the high school stated that they average less than two office discipline referrals a day. At the middle school, we average more than three and sometimes four times that amount per day. But the age and maturity of the students isn't the only difference. Another important factor is that the high school has had years to build its culture with a systematic approach to student discipline. We haven't had a full year yet. The ideal school is one where norms, not rules, drive student behaviors. It takes years to develop this mindset. For student discipline to be effective, it must be timely. Having two assistant principals is necessary for this. Teachers need the support of having an administrative team that can respond to student behavior in real time. The increase of students' behavior outside of school impacting the learning environment also puts added pressure on the administrative team. The explosion of social media use by middle school students who are uniquely qualified, unqualified to use it, consumes uh, significant staff hours of the administrator's day. As the awareness of bullying, intimidation, and harassment continues to grow in our society, the requirements to handle, process, and document it has also increased exponentially. We are still at a very nascent stage of building the systems and processes that support a positive climate and culture. Our partnership with EastCon is an essential part of this work. With EastCon, we are building, working on building the leadership capacity of our teachers through a tier one instructional team. Teachers and administrators are working together to build these systematic supports. Cutting an assistant principal before we have these school-wide positive supports entirely in place would have an adverse impact on the middle school's future. EastCon has been tracking our progress by comparing baseline data from both PMS and MMS collected last year to observation data and staff climate surveys taken this year. I'd like to share uh, with you some of this data since improving climate and culture was one of the main goals for the board this year. Past staff climate surveys indicated that the staff saw having student discipline processes and systems in place as an area of need. Here are some of the data around those indicators. 
The indicator on student expectations are clearly defined, increased from 48.5% to over 73%. The indicator that a team exists for behavior support, planning, and problem solving improved from 26% to 72%. The indicator that the administrative team is an active part of that behavior support team went up from 37% to 61%. The indicator that there is a shared common philosophy for behavior and discipline improved from 42 to 65%. And here are what I think are the most important numbers. From the survey on staff perception of climate, trust, and job satisfaction, the indicator that the climate of the school is positive went up from 33% to 68%. The indicator of teachers' trust in the administration's ability to lead this change of the consolidation surged from 45% up to 80%. The indicators on the teachers' overall job satisfaction shot up from 63% to 90%. Overall, the consolidation of the middle schools was very successful, but I asked the board to stay the course for one more year. I implore the board to trust us in what we are asking for is what we need, and I urge the board to support the work we are doing to finish building the systems and processes the middle school needs for a successful future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. You may recall from the presentation at the last meeting that we are recommending a reduction of a dean position at the middle school, but recommending that we keep the two assistant principals. And you can hear the results from the teachers from the climate at that school, which was one of the board's uh, goals. Um, it's been very successful. But this has been a year of transition with the uh, preschools and fifth grades going back to the elementary schools, with the middle school consolidation and the high school with their maintaining their programs and starting the co-teaching model. It's our recommendation, my recommendation and the principals also, that we stay the course for one more year allow them the stability and consistency that they continue that they can continue to excel um, so the summary i would like to um, to say what what the recommendation is to keep the staffing that we have this year basically and to uh, look at next this coming fall to have a study group to look at where we go in the future the, uh, an example, I give you an example of the high school where we've kept the, the teacher staffing um, numbers level for a few years. We're recommending we do that again for one more year. The middle school enrollment right now is 472. It'll go down by about 10 next year. So it's basically the same. In 2021, the projection is 215, I'm sorry, 415. And the following year down to 388. So my recommendation is this coming year, maintain what you have, enjoy the successes that we've already shown that can happen with these configurations. But this coming fall, early in the fall, September, October, that we look at the next level. What do we do starting in 21, 22, and out for three or four years and make those uh, adjustments in the following year's budget, not this coming year, but in the 21, 22 budget. With that kind of decline, it, it would be the time. We've had the consistency for a couple of years. We'll know better what programs and how they're working. And uh, so anyway, that's, our, that's my recommendation that we uh, uh, approve this, um, that the board move forward with this. Um, you do have a couple options. One of them is to tonight give the direction that this meets your educational needs, meets the needs of the students. We would then bring this back February 13th for approval, or you may hold a special meeting on February 6th for continued discussion about the budget. But as I said earlier, having in September, October, November a study for the following year will be necessary because our enrollment will continue to decline. And we would need at that time to look at the future 21 through maybe 24, 25. If there are any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. I do have a question back on page one. Mm -hmm. uh, there, the curriculum line 55, 100, it's number two on the page. Uh, you said that we had it switched from the funds. 
were for the transportation had come from Title I, and now we're using it for wages? Not only that, we had a, a large carryover um, last year that we used for, for some positions, and we can't continue with the position. We're not adding new positions, um, but we needed to move the transportation into the general fund. And, and what wages are those for? They are listed in the budget from last time. Um, let me see. On page seven, it's the math interventionist of West Vine, the elementary program coordinator, Dean's Mill, West Vine, math in interventionist at Stonington Middle School, reading interventionist at Stonington Middle School, curriculum specialist, middle and high school, family engagement and chronic absenteeism specialist, and a school safety and family engagement specialist. The new equipment, the new floor scrubber, is that something we could put off for a year? Uh, Peter, would you address the floor and the need for the floor scrubber in this budget? Currently at the middle school, we have a 20-inch floor scrubber, which takes uh, more time to run the machine and, and um, clean up the floors. The new floor scrubber that I proposed is a 26-inch uh, floor scrubber, which allows the, the guys to be more effective in their time and, and, and get the job done quicker. Our current floor scrubber that we have right now has also been out for repair five times this year. It's, it's seen its life. Thank you. Peter, <coughs> stay up. <laughs> um, so the, the contract for building management services for all buildings, the, the ABS tech, yes. is that a cost for the technology or cost to, to manage the technology? The, the, that, that's an annual service contract with ABS, who will then uh, monitor our automatic building systems at all five buildings uh, and, and give us a uh, on-call service when we need them for updates and, and, and uh, software upgrades and training. And for the $50,000 Umcor, is that uh, to engineer the system or to manage the system? No, that, that's, that's a service contract for all five schools. For oh, filters, okay. repairs, updates, and um, boiler cleanings at the schools that have them. Thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions, Dr. Riley. Um, for the for the tuition charge for magnet schools, so it's what I heard. It's a, it's a it's a best educated guess. Is that how the increase? Comes about. We don't know. Even mid-year, we sh we could have a student arrive today yeah. in in this year's budget. So it's um, Allison does the projection for the outplacement based on who she who's already in an outplacement and the history that we've had and who she sees coming up that may need an outplacement. And now, if if we have if if we have a higher need than what we have in the budget. Um, are we allowed to go back to the Board of Finance and ask for more money mid-year or no? We could. Um, since I've been here, we have not done that. We've had some increases and we, you know, we have a vacancy, uh, you know, a para custodian. Somebody leaves mid-year and if we have to, we've adjusted things and not filled vacancies and not purchased the floor scrubber or whatever. You know, we've, we've made decisions so we did not have to go back to the Board of Finance, but we could, but I'd rather not. And two, two more questions, if you don't mind, please. Um, on the paraprofessional salary, in, and I'm trying to understand the percentage, because what I heard Gary say is 769 through December 31st, but that does not represent a 50% benchmark like marker, right? And that's page five, so our top, top one. 
So the, what we're asking, or what you're asking for in the budget, the 50% represents 959. So if the 769 is not a 50% of the year, because it's based on days the, sc the, the kids are in school, what, what is 50% what is like? I would have Gary, could you answer that one, please? So, so tell me as a percentage to the year, 769019 represents what of the total year? Out of 180, right? Got it. And um, the, the number 15, which is account number 410, so the 50% benchmark on the same page is 344.159. And, and my apology, I asked that question and I made the, the I kind of asked it backwards, so I made the mistake, so I owe you an apology on that. But so if that represents 50%, 688 would be 100%, right? Uh, I mean, just I'm, I'm being rounding numbers. I agree with you, but but then but then we're asking for like nine. Where's the number? I lost it, Gary. Uh, nine thirty-three seven fifty-eight. that account by, and I don't have it at the top of my head, but I'm going to say close to two hundred fifty to $300,000 over the last three to four years. So we've really decreased public utilities as far as the, in the budget. Thank you. <laughs> Can share my thoughts. Are you, is that it for your question? Another question. I just mm -hmm. need to find it. This is more uh, moving something to a different line. If we're paying for swimming rental, shouldn't that be in athletics? It's a, it's part of the sports. Because when I think of rentals, it's more. Um, like I, I think of administrative, the, the postage machine or copiers or buildings. Um, and if it's saying swimming, it, it we're, we're paying for the use of Fitch High School for our swimming. So that's part of our swim team. So I think that should be in athletics. We can certainly look into that. That makes sense. Gary, thank you. I was the one who asked for those percentages across the different towns to get a basis on uh, what we are comparatively. So thank you for doing that homework. Are there questions um, from anyone else? I would add, if you, if you think of something, send it to us. We'll send it back out, to the, the answer to the full board. Um, and just let, uh, I just let you know if they're interested in the February 6th meeting or not. I, th I think we would be interested in February 6th. I think we still have some more things to, um, some more questions that will come forward after we sure. are able to sit and digest this. And also have the information that Jack requested, and that gives you the time to um, prepare that. Sure. Um, what does, is there an opinion from 
other board members that we do need one more? We do, I agree. Okay, so we'll definitely be meeting on February 6th to um, finish up the budget. Please, any questions, please direct them to, to me uh, or Dr. Riley. If you um, send it to all of us, then we all know the questions and then they're not being repeated. And I, I did ask that the complete budget, uh, like we have in our packet, be posted on the website. So although you don't have new numbers, all the, the budget and those numbers will be put on the uh, Stonington Public Schools website for everyone to have access to. Next item on the agenda is the 2019-2020 school calendar change. You have in front of you a recommended motion basically to switch March 13th and April 28th. Um, so March 13th would be a regular day in session and April 28th would be a non-student day for professional learning. The reason for that is April 28th is the election and we have a, at Dean's Mill School, it would be difficult for us to open it up for people wanting to vote while we're trying to have school that day. So you see the motion in front of you and we would appreciate a vote on that one. I have a motion. A motion to approve the revised 2019-2020 school calendar with the change of March 13 as a school in session day district-wide and change April 28 to a no-school no day district-wide for professional learning. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Nays? The motion passes. And the next item is the upcoming year, 2020-21 school calendar. As I discussed last time, uh, Labor Day is, is very late, and if we start after Labor Day, which I think is all of our preference, we would end up in, in late June, and if we had snow days, it could cause, cause an issue. Um, I will say that I've shared this with the local chambers of commerce because they would like us to continue with the after Labor Day start if possible. I believe they understand that this one year will need to start earlier. This coincides with the learn calendar. So we have the same, basically the same winter and spring breaks, et cetera. So we would like approval on this so we can share it with parents who are calling and asking about it. Motion to approve the Stonington Public Schools 2020-2021 uh, school calendar as presented. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We have our 2021 school calendar. We'll move to the next uh, part of our agenda. Uh, we'll have comments from citizens relative to second independent investigation. And before we start those comments, I just want to make sure it's clear that we have not hired an investigator. We have not selected an investigator. We are going through the process. We'll go through discussions. And that, that won't be selected tonight. Um, this is a process that may take one or two uh, meetings. Um, I reached out to four attorneys for their suggestions. And a list will be brought forward. Uh, to the board for selection, and we'll talk a little bit more about that process um, a little bit further on. But I just wanted to make sure if that was anybody's concerns that, um, that that investigator has not yet been selected, and um, that if that was the concern that I wanted to uh, alleviate that. And as we move forward, um, are there any comments from citizens relative to the second independent investigation? Good evening, everybody. Some of you know me, some of you don't. My name is John Nazaro, and I'm a resident in Stonington since probably 1987 or so. Um, and I come here with a heavy heart, number one, because 
here because of published reports about what went on with uh, Mr. Chokis, various female complainants, and the problem that's now before you as the Board of Education, the superintendent, and the townspeople. And before I comment further, I want to indicate all three of my children attended public schools here in Stonington. Uh, my daughter graduated here in middle school and then went on to private school. My two sons went all the way through uh, Stonington Public School. My son Alexander was president of his class for grades 5 through 12. He attended Catholic Middle School and graduated in 2010, where he was, uh, as I said, president of his class and captain of the football team. I'm an attorney now, and I volunteered in many capacities throughout my life uh, here in the town and elsewhere. I've coached uh, football, soccer, boys, girls, uh, served on nonprofits, served on the Charter Commission back in 1988. I've uh, been involved in both political parties, DWI Citizens Advisory Committee, with the Pawkatuck Neighborhood Center, the late uh, Bob Granado, I think that was 1988. I see a lot of friends in the room and a lot of concerned townspeople. I'll say this too, um, before I was an attorney, I was a news reporter. And um, news reporters are not our enemies. And I want to thank the media to a large extent for shedding light on these issues. And I have to tell you, it's distressing when I see governmental entities fighting disclosure of information which should be disclosed, and then newspapers or media outlets have to go to the Freedom of Information Commission, litigate disclosure, obtain disclosure, and through a lot of effort, obtain what should be properly in the public domain voluntarily. I neglected to say something to all of you board members. I want to thank you for doing your jobs and volunteering for this service. It is truly a thankless duty. Some of you are education professionals, a lot of you are parents, and, and a lot of you, and all of you without exception, are concerned townspeople, and that's why you serve. Um, I'll tell you, this is a very difficult issue. As a lawyer in my former life, uh, I did and was involved in labor negotiations. I represented police officers. I represented educators. I was involved in separations with teachers accused of misconduct in this town and elsewhere. My practice is limited to a different area. And I'm not looking for any business, I guarantee you that. I want to tell you, uh, in large part, what I know is based upon what I've read in the newspapers. But I regret to say, I was contacted by a couple of females who were subjects of inappropriate contact. And in each instant, they relayed to me personal regret about not doing more because they had siblings, they had daughters that followed in their footsteps who suffered similar abuse. Again, a large part of what I, I know is from the newspapers and what I can say is in the newspaper account of January 19, uh, Mr. Woe just details what occurred through obtainment of information through FOI. If the information is accurate, we have a serious problem here. And this board is going to undertake a decision whether to have an investigation. Well, I know about investigations because I started doing that for the federal government in 1982 in Washington. And then I was involved in public corruption and organized crime investigation and prosecution in 1982-83. And that can be quite involved. If uh, the board undertakes an investigation here, I, th I think as just my opinion, a legitimate area might be if there were policies in place, and it appears there were, were the policies followed? And if not, why not? And more to the point, perhaps, what can we do going forward to make sure that children, that youths, 
that people in the schools, students, are protected and that bad conduct does not recur. A policy is only as bad as the paper it's written on and then not followed. Two weeks ago, I was in a meeting of the NAACP, which I became involved in about a year ago, and there was an incident in New London High School where two police officers came in and demanded to see some students. Students were brought in, they were interviewed, they were told not to go to the NFA New London football game. There was a gang problem in Norwich, gang members coming over into New London, stuff we don't have to deal with here in our town of Stonington. But in that process, we discovered that New London school officials disregarded their written policies, that no police officer is to interview a student without a parent or a teacher being present. Black and white policy. Did everybody fall asleep? I don't know, but I, I got to tell you, we can have all the committees and all the study groups. You have policies. They were, I presume, adopted after debate, discussion, workshops. Are we going to follow them? Before you undertake an investigation, I think you have to decide the scope of your investigation. I did read the press account about this discussion with the lawyer from Mirtha Kalina, an estimate of 20 to 40,000. Let me tell you what you don't want. This is another reason I'm here. You don't want to be facing a $200,000 legal bill. I know I'm a lawyer. I don't work on hourly now, but I can tell you it goes quick. We needn't look that far back anecdotally. There was a dispute with a town employee in town hall and if I'm not mistaken, if published reports are correct, the legal bills exceeded a couple hundred thousand dollars. I believe those bills were paid. I know everybody involved professionally. All I can say this is be careful what you embark on. I don't think it's a good idea to try to undertake an investigation of some 10 years of potential complaints. I think that's gargantuan personally. I understand that there are victims out there who are angry. I know about that. Our firm is probably the leader in Connecticut in, per in pursuing priest abuse cases. And you'd only ask my partner, Kelly Reardon. So you have to be careful of the scope. There is going to be a report released by the state of Connecticut. I'm not looking to slow track anything. I think public safety is paramount, certainly. I like the idea of a workshop to refamiliarize teachers, administrators, uh, those invested people who are stakeholders, PTA folks, et cetera, on the process of making complaints and following up and briefing individuals, et cetera, on what is appropriate procedure. I'm all for that. But uh, you might want to wait to get that report to see exactly what it covered and what it doesn't cover and decide what scope of investigation you want. I think it's great, and I'm glad to hear from the Madam Chair Chairwoman, that uh, you might look at uh, a number of law firms. Uh, you don't want somebody to learn as you go. I, I would think it's, it's a good idea to get people who are experienced in this area. They're out there. Uh, and. Um, Remember, too, when you're dealing with lawyers, I'm laughing, they're always on the clock. I was, for a while, the presid a presiding family judge in Norwich Court. And I've been, uh, I was a retired judge and back practicing, as I said. I can tell you, in looking at lawyer bills, especially in family court, oh my gosh. Every phone call is billed at a quarter hour increment. And before you know it, the bills eat through the roof. and. And ethical domestic lawyers meet with their clients on day one and say, hey, you know, if you're going to vent, I suggest you get a therapist. They're probably cheaper than me. Every contact, the, the, the bill is rolling. And, and it's a tough thing because this is an issue worthy of investigation, I think. I think we have to, we have to do better, um, certainly. Um, I'll say this, uh, I appeared in a public forum many years ago when there was a selectman. Frankly, there was a, a buyout 
for that selectman to leave under a cloud involving complaints of sexual misconduct. I spoke at that town meeting and I said, folks, you might just want to approve of this because this is a relatively less cost than you're going to pay through litigation. And um, the teacher involved here is gone. Uh, we can't change that. What we need to look is the, as the process for protecting these children and to making sure conduct doesn't recur. Um, I don't envy your task. You're all well-intentioned. Um, I also think that there is information out there in the way of a record that was already created through FOI, which is obtainable, and uh, individuals can cull through that information. I just don't think anyone really wants or needs or requires uh, a full-blown investigation into a period of time over a, dec a decade or 12 years to interview hundreds of complainants. I just can't imagine what the cost of that would be, and I'm not in any way minimizing the harm, uh, for the most part, from, from females, I'm pretty sure. So if you have procedures, and you do, let's follow them, let's educate staff on how to follow them, and um, if it requires taking action regarding any existing employee of any kind, that's up to the, to the board to decide. Um, and certainly going forward, I, 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 I thank you again in, in undertaking this decision. I think it's the right decision. The timing and the scope, those are issues to be explored. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Nazaro. I will say I did let Attorney Nazaro go a little bit longer because I thought he had some great insight uh, to offer all of us tonight. Um, the limit is uh, five minutes per speaker. Uh, we usually do also have 20 minutes per topic. I know this is a sensitive one, so we'll let it go just a, a little bit longer than that, 20 minutes. But if we could be mindful of the time frame that we're up at the podium, that would be appreciative. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Noreen Keppel. I spoke at the August 8th meeting on mandatory reporting in the Chokus matter, and we're still here talking about it at this time. I would like to share a few thoughts again with you this evening. The topic of sexual harassment can be such a gray area. How one person defines it may not be the same as how another person defines it. That is challenge number one. I do know that if a girl experiences it, she knows when it is happening and it is no longer gray to her. Some voice in her head tells her, these actions are not right, not appropriate, not acceptable. The girls that spoke up felt that. They wanted that gray area to be illuminated by their reporting, and they wanted their actions to be validated. They were let down by their reporting, being watered down to concerns, interactions with people, and reports. This underscores defining what sexual harassment is. I wonder that if these same actions happened to young men by a female teacher, would this process have been the same? That is just something to ponder. Maybe some gender education would be appropriate in the upcoming workshop, especially as to how the reported actions make young girls and boys feel, or how it affects the learning environment in a specific classroom. I'm sure there were girls that were affected by Mr. Chokas that were afraid to report. They carry his inappropriate actions inside of them, and I'm sure those actions have changed them. My hope is that the workshop on January 27th will start to bring closure to this open wound that has afflicted our town, and we can all learn from it and put forth clear positive changes that will only make our town, our schools, and our citizens better. History is being written here. Do you want that history to be clear and truthful? Or do you want that history to be filled with doubt and chaos? 
Each one of you has to answer for yourselves on what you want that history to be. A vision created into a plan that will yield results, will generate trust in the community. A trust that is so sorely needed. A second independent investigation just might give us this. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Keppel. As you can see, um, <laughs> the articles in the day have been coming faster and faster and more furious, and so it's kind of hard to keep up with the latest. And I um, first want to thank the board for all your service. That, that's the bottom line is, um, you know, it's not fun for you guys to be up here and to be in this situation. Um, I would much rather be talking about um, early, you know, later school hours. I'd, much be, I'd rather talk about SAT scores. I'd rather talk about um, uh, unified sports. But again, um, this is my fifth time that um, I've been up here. Um, Noreen and I um, talked August 8th. Um, about, wow, 30 girls came forward and said that they were inappropriately touched. And this is just 30 girls that reported it, not did a concern that um, these, are, these are all minors, but they had the courage to come forward. This was August 8th. Again, 30 girls is mind-blowing. If you count um, a side of this um, uh, cafeteria, that is less than 30 people. So that's a lot of, of girls. Um, I came yeah, um, November 14th. I was kind of asking, um, urging you to um, start to conduct the private investigation. Um, I came December 12th, and I was now pleading for you to start the, um, the investigation because, I don't know, this is really important. Um, and so on January 9th, I think I was just mad um, because, um, you know, uh, we had a three to four um, vote as, as to... Um, an investigation, and unfortunately, the the vote lost by one vote. Anyway, um, Faith, I'm it, sorry, but we never voted. Okay. Um, is is that it? No. Oh, oh, you want? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you told me no, no, no more time. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Alexandra Capel. She's not here tonight, but um, in her statement um, after I had left on January 9th, that um, she is representing the student council and the student body. And I, how great is that when the students are now speaking up? Um, also, um, Martin Vernet. Um, he was a 2019 grad. For those that missed the meeting, um, this gentleman eloquently explained that, um, um, and quote, on, on um, January 9th, and this was in the January 11th article, he says, what matters is that the school was aware of Chokas' behavior towards girls for more than a decade. And a decade is 10 years. Those in power tasked with protecting their students failed to do just that and should be held responsible for their allowance and acceptance of such behavior or the cor over the course of 15 years. All right, this is a 2000 Stonington grad, 2019 Stonington grad. So under the age of 21, 
how eloquent, I couldn't have said it any better. He hit the nail on the head. Um, we as, as residents, we as parents, and also, um, I know that the Stonington High School is going through their midterms exams, so they're, they're doing their, their thing right now. They're studying. And um, we entrust um, that our superintendent and our school officials um, keep our children safe. This is not a personal ma personnel matter anymore. This is a safety issue. And... Um, Faith, can you wrap it up? Okay, wrap it up. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs> I um, am still waiting for any comments from Dr. Riley as far as his thoughts into what he thinks. Is this, is this a horrible matter? Is this something that, that um, uh, is important? Um, did we do everything possible? So I am still waiting. And uh, Mr. Chokas has been gone since January 19th last year. So um, I look forward to any replies. Um, from Dr. Riley, and I also look for, um, I thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Good evening. I must first say to all you current and former students that might have had an unfortunate experience with former teacher Chokas, my apologies to you all. Second, on the advice of multiple attorneys that I have spoken with on your behalf, you are to hold your tongue tonight until you get legal representation to protect yourself. I understand your feelings, you're hurt, you're disappointed, and some of you are mad. Remember, you're speaking against the teachers' union, their attorneys, the Board of Ed's attorneys, and the superintendent's attorneys. And clearly, they have nothing, done nothing for you so far. So please let us adults speak for you tonight. Just so everyone is aware that the state statute to bring a civil matter against anyone regarding this type of issue is you have up until the age of 48 to bring litigation. So, Board of Ed members, what you do today will have a much future impact. Let me make this very clear for you all. A freshman in 2018-2019 that might have had any inappropriate interaction with Chokas, that gives that student till the farthest, farthest possible year, maybe 2053 or 2054, depending on that child's birth date. Now, on the matter of opening a private investigation. Do you think it's wise to hire a lawyer firm to investigate this matter? There are private firms out there which would be more unbiased than a law firm recommended to you by someone that will go under, be under this investigation. Would the police department go to a drug dealer and ask, who would you like to investigate you? So why are you allowing the superintendent that option? Enough of the cover-up like the one Epstein and Weinstein. It blew up in the politicians' faces that covered those up. Do you want to be like them? Remember, the girls have until they turn 48 years of age. Do you want to be looking over the shoulder for your, the rest of your life? And for your information, you can contact the Pickerton Agency, who are one of the few top investigators in the world. 1-800-724-1616. And remember, this group of people started our Secret Service. No case is too small or large for them. Thank you for speaking. Hello, my name is Kate Mildy, and it's really hard for me to be up here, um, not only as a resident of Mystic, um, not only as a parent of a child under your care, also, as a recent Stonington High employee, I am the only member of the Stonington High staff, um, Stonington Public School staff, that is now speaking up um, and advocating for these children. And I am really disappointed in the majority of your responses to this matter. This is a crisis. Um, it, I, I don't think that any amount of money would 
would, um, I don't think that the budget concern that he brought up is worth a concern. I think it is worth every cent to get to the bottom of this to protect our children. I think it's your responsibility. I think, um, you know, you ha your hesitation to do the right thing and your inaction is why this is now a crisis. I think that uh, you, you see people here demanding transparency. I think that has not happened. It's your responsibility to be transparent. Uh, any, it, any information that's come out through the day that you disagree with, you have not responded to. And an investigation would clear anybody that you're saying maybe isn't guilty of these things. So your inaction on this matter is digging you a deeper hole. It's making you look worse. And it's a disappointment because I was a member of this, this high school. I trusted everyone here to, to care for these kids. I was there when Chokas was fired I, I, and, and with salary. Like all of these things I learned when the day started reporting, this was outrageous to me and I just couldn't keep quiet anymore. I just really think that you know, I'm standing here shaking, it's emotional, and, and I wasn't even directly affected by this other than seeing children affected by this. So I, I really think um, it's important and imperative, and I implore you to have an independent investigation done not by someone who's known to defend school administrators, but by someone who's known to advocate for sexual assault victims. I really am trusting you now to do the right thing, and I look forward to you moving forward in a transparent way where you're not trying to hide anything from anyone or cover anything up so that we can put this matter to rest. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Thank you, everyone who got up and spoke. Move on to discussing the second independent investigation. Um, as you can see, it's a very complicated process, um, not something we'll be doing in, in one night, certainly, and um, certainly lots of discussion to uh, go forward. I can start with some of the process that I've learned from the variety of lawyers I've spoken to so far. Um, to see, to let you know what the, the general process is. There were some questions that some board members have, so maybe we'll start with that. Um, I was asked, do we need a bid waiver or an RFP? Uh, no, we, we do not. Um, and the engagement letter will have, when we do that, that has the, the rate, the scope, uh, and that will outline all the costs, the expectations, and, and all of that. Um, can we do an interview or a meeting? Certainly. Um, there was one person I spoke to who uh, almost made that part of the first part of their plan to sit and meet and to talk a little bit more about the scope and really find out what we want to know and, and then um, from there uh, shape the investigation. Um, how long will the investigation go on for? I've been told that depends on the extent of the scope of the investigation and how many people are willing to speak to the investigator. They did say that the further back you go, the less likely you'll have people who, a volume of people who will participate, but um, they just said it's, sometimes it's hard to track people down. And that was a, a, a variety or, or different um, number of people who, st who stated that. So we will need to uh, at least loosely determine the scope and then we can kind of narrow it down fr from there. Uh, we will need a signed engagement letter and um, our uh, attorney, Nick Grello, provides no direction or, or contact for that attorney. The, the independent investigator is truly independent and as I've had conversations with uh, a variety of lawyers, they say, keep in mind, I'm, I'm never going to work for you again, so I, I need to keep my um, credibility out there for doing a good job. Um, the, the, anyone I spoke to said they would begin with the administration. Uh, they would request documents. They will interview uh, students, past students. Uh, they will provide the board at the end a written document uh, there are times when people can provide a verbal 
explanation, we said no, we want it in writing so that way um, it can't be interpreted or misinterpreted that we are construing or changing what was provided to us. Um, and that seemed to be a across a variety of, of people I spoke with. Uh, something to keep in mind is that nobody has to participate in this investigation. This will all be have to be willing participants. So that's something, again, to keep in mind when we're um, hiring. We, we can stop the investigation at any time if we feel we have the information we need. They are employed by us, the Board of Education. Um, those are just some uh, of, of the highlights that I saw just to kind of outline a little bit of the, of the process. Go ahead, Heidi. So, <clears throat> it, to me it seems that before making a final decision on an independent investigation, it's important, as our lawyers have spoken about, that the board agree on a purpose and a scope of this investigation. No investigator will work for us unless we're able to give them a clear purpose and scope. The purpose would be to get a legal opinion. The scope would be the specifics that we want investigated. And that's where we need board agreement. Some of these specifics we need to discuss are whether or not the investigation should be conducted by a woman because of the special nature of the problem. And we need to make sure that the scope of the independent investigation is different from the scope of the Office of Child Advocate Investigation. The scope of the independent investigation would consider whether or not there was negative impact on our students because of the behavior of Mr. Chokas. So we would discuss whether or not the independent investigator would investigate exactly what Mr. Chokas did. Did he transgress to sexual harassment or sexual abuse? It's only when we know this that we will know what students dealt with and how we need to deal with students both past and present. And of course, we do need to know the details of the non-disclosure agreement and if or how it limits the investigating of this case. We're elected officials. We have constituents who have put us here. Actually, you are our bosses and you've assumed we will make good decisions. I think we have made a good decision in having an independent investigation. Now we need to decide on the purpose and scope and the particulars of this investigation. The, investigation, the investigator would begin by finding facts. What did Mr. Chokas do? Were students harmed mentally or physically? Did the grown-ups fail the children? What aspect of the high school's culture allowed this to go on for over 14 years? Then knowing all this, we can decide what to do to help those impacted. And to reiterate what John said, how to move forward so this never happens again. I do have a professional legal candidate for consideration for this investigation, it's Paula Anthony. She works for Bircham Moses in Devlin in Milford, Connecticut, and she's worked on investigations for boards of education. However, she said she will not make any commitment until the board has agreed upon a purpose and the scope of the investigation. I recommend that the board consider Ms. Anthony for this investigation. Um. Certainly give me her name and her contact information. That would be um, very helpful. Thank you for um, pursuing that. Uh, through all this, when we've had the conversation that yes, we, uh, I do agree, and please give me some suggestions. Um, Mr. Morehouse actually had provided me a suggestion as well, uh, had a little conversation. We uh, both agreed this, this person would, would be great. This person is not available to us. And, um, but through this discussion, we also realized yeah, perhaps uh, going forward, um, I received a name, someone contacted me. Um, and 
I shared that name with, with Jack so that I could get his opinion. I think people at, at, from out there view us as coming from different sides. Uh, we don't, we, we get along, we, have, we don't always agree on everything, but uh, we respect each other. And so one, one thought was that perhaps um, as we're looking at all these names, as I'm hopefully going to receive more names from um, these different attorneys I've asked for recommendations from, perhaps Jack and I could, could share um, the names if we both agree, goes on a list, and we maybe aren't able to narrow it down to, to three or so, whatever the board agrees on and uh, are then able to take it forward from there because it's a lot of footwork and it's a lot of legwork and I was wondering what uh, people thought of, of that concept or that idea. I also have two names Great. that were brought to me by other people. Uh, okay. Paula Anthony from uh, uh, Bertram Moses and uh, Can Johanna you speak into the microphone Sorry, a little bit more? I'm Johanna Zellman from Fort Harrison. Okay. Not, not Harrison Ford, that would be uh. from Fort Harrison <laughs> That would be really cool. <laughs> for in Hartford. And I just want to add to Heidi's comments about the, the scope of the investigation. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we really need to come up with mm -hmm. as, a, as a group. Yes. Because while hers are great, I have a bunch of other things that I wanted to address, more of the policies, how are the complaints filed, um, what happened, and really the difference between what the press has reported and what other people are saying. So sure. to get to the bottom of, there's always you know, three sides of the story. So those are some of my, poly my, my procedural and scope mm -hmm. issues. Did and you I want to thank the board for actually doing this. I've been asking for this, this investigation since um, July. <coughs> and so I'm glad that the board has finally agreed to perhaps go forward with it. Did you want to go through any of those items you were talking about now, Elisa? Uh, we can just do it all together. Because okay, great. Because so much stuff. I agree. That if we just put it all in one because I just sure. came up with a bunch right now. And I think that other people are going to have other things that we might want to incorporate in the scope. Okay. And so that would be a really well thought out scope. Yes. So, how, I right. think Jack wanted to speak. Yeah, I just wanted to know. Yep. So, moving forward, what, what would be a, what would be the process here? Because I also have a kind of a set of criteria that I would like to introduce into the mix. Mm -hmm. So, um, it would be great if we could kind of consolidate our ideas and start looking at candidates. How what how would we go about that? What would be the process? Um, well, I think. We're talking about maybe a little bit of two different parts of the process, uh, the candidates and the, um, the scope. Okay. I mean, we need the scope because we need to know that um, the people we're hiring fit the, that, that scope. Um, we could certainly uh, create, listen to everybody tonight. You could run through uh, what your thoughts are and what you believe the scope is and then uh, narrow it down um, from there. Uh, and I also believe like that one investigator who said that he felt that come up with a, a general scope and then through that first meeting we sit and you express all of your ideas and your thoughts and then from his experience he can kind of narrow, narrow down and create a direction uh, and within our agreement and then include that in an engagement. Um, different ways, different people have different approaches from their experience, I believe. I think it's going to be hard, or not hard, but to come up with our scope and then yes, it's sort of a catch I agree. 22. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's the lawyer might give us some other ideas of things that we're not going to know about a scope. And so maybe that would come out in the interview process when we start talking to sure. them. We could have some rough draft of some of the things of our scope and they may have, they're professionals in this. Right. We're, we're novices. We're not. <laughs> right. Um, and they're going to help us develop a more, more concrete scope. I agree. So I think we have a general scope and some thoughts, and then they're going to come up with a, a more exact scope. Perhaps by listening to our concerns. Scope is how they will proceed with that mm -hmm. scope in order to give us some kind of time estimate as right. well. So they I think it, it, it's, it's a work in progress, I think. I would agree with you. And don't we have to wait until the Office of Child Advocate lets us know? Because many of the things we are talking about, if are not pursued by, haven't been pursued by her, those definitely will have to be part of the scope for our independent investigator. Well, my hope is that um, as we are hopefully, need to move along on this process in a thoughtful way, but, and not Herod, but we do need to, to not uh, waste time, so to speak, but be effective in what we're doing. Um, I'm I, sorry, but, but yes, I, I really ahead. like, 
many of you sit here and speak, and, and I'm not a good follower of rules. Mm -hmm. We heard you in August, and we heard you in September. And Jack and I sat on the stairs of the high school, I think in August, or I don't remember the date. And he said, we need, to, we need to launch an investigation into what happened and if rules were followed or not followed. And I said to him, we need a guideline, we need a rail to drive that investigation because I know how we can rack up hundreds of thousands of dollars into <coughs> investigation. We need, we, we, the problem does not no longer exist, but we need to fix the problem. We need to make sure there is no other problem in there. We were waiting on the office of, you know, on the state to finish their investigation. And that's what really got us to this point. No, um, we'll, there will be time for comment at, at the end. And Thank I would you. be happy to take your, your so question we, then. I don't suggest that we continue to wait for the state. So that's my comment. Can I just follow up from the follow up? Um, it's not exactly what I said, but. Um, <laughs> Close to a jack. Yeah. Sometime or Sometime. It was at the Como, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, we know a couple of things. We know that, uh, that Mrs. E Ms. Egan um, did not interview students. She did not interview teachers. So we know that that whole part of the investigation has not taken place. So I, I believe that we can at least, look, nobody wants to see this. It's not fair to the administrators. It's not fair to the students. Um, we don't want a rushed investigation because we've come this far. We want a thoughtful, fair, transparent investigation. I think we all want that. Um, but it's, it's important also to keep it moving along. I agree with Farouk. Um, and I think to s <coughs> one way or, the, or another, we know we're gonna be hiring somebody. So I think we, we move down that pathway, whatever that looks like, and, um, and uh, we, we move forward. It's, it's in fairness to everyone who's involved. And can we, I, I'm not sure if, if we can, and, and your, our fields leader can tell us, but can we sit together in one room soon and come up with what we want of that investigation exactly as a scope. Can't we get together in one room and just do that? And then based on that, we can decide on hiring somebody. And we're not hiring somebody that's getting just, you know, it's not, it's not a whitewash. We want to do the right thing. So we want to hire the right person that we can agree is the right person that can serve the purpose. But can we sit in a room and just agree on the scope of the investigation and what do we really want to investigate? Yes, I 100% I, I, I agree. I, w Great. I look forward to that, and I think it should be soon. Not next week, because I'm not here, but the week <laughs> after it would be fine. Um, we do, we have a meeting on February 6th. For, that was budget that we could tag on, but we could try to do it earlier in that week, perhaps. I, we could, I'll send out a, a doodle, or we'll send out a schedule, and we'll see what works for, for everybody as, as, as soon as, as uh, possible. How does, how does that sound to people? And we'll make it a public discussion. It, it has to be. Uh, good. <laughs> I think it should be. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So that way, from, from this point, if, until we have that meeting, people can help formulate their thoughts a little bit more, um, more particularly. And what do people think of the process of uh, Jack and I sharing, uh, looking at different investigators and then bringing those names back to everybody? I am not sure I'm really enthusiastic about that because I'm not sure why, I, I don't know why you two have chosen to do the filtering and I think that um, I would have quite a, some heavy input as well so I think that that's part of the group process, the group discussion, not just two people figuring out and then moving forward. So I mean, I, I okay, feel strongly about fine. my candidate, and of course, um, and a, and also about separating, uh, making a true independent investigation. Um, you know, not in any ways connected to the end of the entity that we're investigating. Sure, I I do not think though that. Uh, six or seven of us should be calling every attorney. No. 
which I'm done I, calling. Uh, so we'll need to think of uh, that process because I've been I've been speaking to um, a variety of attorneys to try to figure out who would be well. I, able I don't. To bring forward. I think that we come to the table not necessarily all of us coming with an attorney, but we come to gather and discuss it, mm -hmm. and then show the qualifications that sure. we see and I. I and then decide about interviewing even too. But I, sure. I feel uncomfortable just two people on the board making that decision. Okay. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, yep. Jack. Um, I agree with you. And I think we, it should be all of us. But um, it, it, maybe there's some kind of a format where we could, um, in order to make initial comparisons, uh, whether, I don't know sure. what that would be. Yeah, we um, can do a rubric. Well, yeah. yeah. That, that yeah, sounds fine. Sure. Um, so we can create a rubric. And one thing, I do have a item here. I saw a checklist, um, independent investigator hiring checklist. And it says it should be an attorney. It says it should be experienced in independent investigation. Are they available to start and complete an investigation? Has the investigator been referred or cleared by someone you trust? Does the person have a calm professional demeanor and give sense of what they would create, that they would create a comfortable interview? Are they truly neutral, any relationship with anyone involved? Has the investigator made any promises to outcome? This could be a sign of the investigator's bias or that they won't be thorough. An investigator can never predict the outcome or ultimate cost at the outset of the investigation, they say, be careful of someone who says this is what it's going to cost because they're not sure how much time that they're going to end up putting into that. Um, that was just a little bit of, of, of background. So we would like a, a meeting set up so that we can, at this meeting, uh, what is our hope to achieve, achieve to narrow down our list of, of attorneys, create the scope, what, what will all of the above? Well, are we doing the scope first and then decide on the attorney because that mm -hmm. will drive us towards the person? Sure. And that's what the attorney said that I was talking to, mm -hmm. that she would not consider sure. until the scope and purpose of course. Had, had were very well defined. Sure. I, th yeah. I think in a workshop we can decide on the scope and purpose so we can find the, pr the right attorney and you know, can give us also a gauge on the cost because we have to, mm -hmm. to figure out how we're going to pay for it as well. I agree. I think with the coming up with the scope and purpose is first, but also I think at the meeting people can bring names of attorneys, we can at least start make, compiling a list sure. of people we may want to look into more to see if they fit with our scope. And also and availability. We develop our rubric, our hiring Okay, rubric. that's a good idea, the rubric and the, so and we'll know the purpose. And set a timeline. I'd also like to see some kind of a timeline for when we're going to interview, when we're going to start. Because it's going to take a while to get the interviews. <coughs> with the, I, I am not hiring a lawyer without meeting them and interviewing them. Uh, of course, <laughs> I think we'll be able to <laughs> narrow down our list but to like send before some we get to timeline. Sure. On on what we're what we're going to do, and we're, clearly we're going to be needing to set up a lot more meetings, so also to throw out some potential things. Sure. And how it's going to proceed. Thank you. That was very helpful. Was there any other questions specifically on uh, process or procedure? Heidi, do you have any other? The procedure, is there any other questions on procedure of investigation or hiring process? Right. I think, this right is, I think this is a good direction to go. I just have one, one question, I guess, to procedure. At sure. every other meeting, when we've talked about this, we've taken votes that have always been tuned down. Do we need to vote on starting an in uh, investigation? Yes, make I think motion. we need a motion. Yeah. Go. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to begin a 
pri second in independent investigation? Second. So I have a first and a second. Um, do we need any discussion? <laughs> we just had it. I think so. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All, all in favor. The motion passes. So I will send out a calendar. I will send out a calendar for a meeting for uh, setting up the uh, scope of the investigation and then also our creating our rubric. So any information people have at that time to bring forward be, would be wonderful. Thank you for everybody's um, efforts. Next is the workshop um, update on January 27th. Um, that workshop, we're very happy that Safe Futures has agreed to attend and participate. And um, that will be extremely helpful. They'll spend some time at the end of the meeting. So at this point, the, the layout is uh, four parts. There will be a presentation by Mrs. Van Etten and that will be updates on procedures and policies that have been made over the last, uh, since Ju June or July, how the district has included our stakeholders in that. Uh, next up would be Marianne addressing the curriculum, education for our students and families, and training and education for staff regarding sexual harassment. And what we've done so far that we've improved upon and what do we are going to be continuing <coughs> to do. And third, Safe Futures, uh, we weren't sure they would be able to attend, but we're very happy that they're going to be able to be here and participate and uh, explain a little bit of our new partnership with them, which will be ongoing. And they will assist with support for students, past, present, and future. So they're a very integral part of this whole process of healing and moving forward and providing uh, our students with some guidance and some education that will help them on how to be comfortable in reporting and how to how to how families can also understand that process and then at the end we'll take uh, comments from public on items listed above and then additional ideas and how we can include our stakeholders uh, there's ways we're already doing it, and they're going to go through and explain that. So make sure that everybody is still currently involved and continue to be involved going forward, not just three months from now, not just six months from now, but that we make this a part of, of Stonington uh, Public Schools. At this time, are there any comments from citizens? Yes. Always Can been. Candace is not. Always been. Candace is not here tonight. Uh, she has uh, serious health issues. She's addressing. Her attendance will be uh, sporadic, and uh, but she also is has expressed that she is in support. Jim Spellman, starting high school graduate, seven years teacher in Stoneyton Public Schools, football coach. I highly recommend to the uh, Stoneyton Board of Education that at the upcoming workshop, the expertise and the authority of the Department of Children and Family be utilized. It would behoove the board to have the compliance officer on mandated reporting present to the group to set down the definitive law of the state of Connecticut that supersedes and overrules any board or school district policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spellman. Do I have any more public comments? Can I have any board comments or concerns? If 
thank you for everybody who attended tonight, and I would like a motion to adjourn. Motion, meeting adjourned.